Good morning, everybody. It's so wonderful to, to be back here in person to have the fan book vigil. I'm just so excited to be here and to speak. I've been attending this event for so many years, and uh, to get to speak today is just such an honor. Um, and I, I really want to thank Paulette and everybody else on the coalition, including Derek and Arju, for all of their hard work and labor of love and putting this wonderful event on that is all about the freedom to read, intellectual freedom, and to celebrate books and reading, which is, of course, near and dear to my heart as a librarian. So today I am going to be talking about Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre and the ethics of trigger warnings. Um, I am the nursing librarian at the Mulford Health Science Library on the Health Science campus as part of the University Library. Um, if you do have any questions about my presentation, please don't hesitate to, to contact me. I'm, I'm always, always happy uh, to, to talk about anything Bronte related. Um, I have uh, just been a, a devoted um, reader of the Bronte since, since I was a teenager. So. Right. So in early 2022, Salford University in Manchester, England issued a note accompanying a reading list of several classic literary works for students in the BA English program. The Daily Mail um, heard of, of this and they submitted a freedom of information request to get some more information uh, about the, the note that uh, accompanied these texts. And, and this is what they received um, from Salford. So this is taken from, from the note that accompanied the list. There are scenes and discussions of violence and sexual violence in several of the primary texts studied on this module. Some students may find the content of the following texts distressing. Included on this list were Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, Dickens's Great Expectations, and many others, including uh, not just novels, but also poetry, including some of Robert Browning's work, as well as um, Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market, I, I believe, was also on the list. So this uh, opened up some, some interesting thought to me um, as, as somebody who has read and reread Jane Eyre many, many times. It's, it, it truly is a book that, that changed my life. And I was very interested to see, you know, what would um, uh, trigger a, a trigger warning for, for this book as well as other classics. And then I became interested in the whole trigger warning ethical debate surrounding it. And I thought it would make a good uh, topic for banned books because it is trigger warnings, I think, are one of the, the topics that have um, in years past been one of the lesser explored areas of intellectual freedom, but in more recent years, I think they've gotten some more attention. It's very interesting. The definition of trigger warning, actually in 2022, the um, Oxford English Dictionary um, drafted a definition, a new definition for it. So they define trigger warnings as a statement preceding a piece of writing, video, et cetera, alerting the reader, viewer, et cetera, to the fact that it contains material or content that may cause distress, especially by reviving upsetting memories and people who have experienced trauma. And that actually is where trigger warnings originate um, from, from social work and, and um, individuals who have experienced PTSD. And so um, when the press asked Salford University for a little bit more information about the content note that they, they issued, Salford University did say that the content note was not intended to be a trigger warning, but a content warning. And there has actually been some debate about those two terms, and sometimes they're actually used interchangeably to kind of mean the same thing. With that said, this is not the first time that Jane Eyre has been talked about in the context of trigger warnings. There is a book, Trigger Warning Wiki, as you see here on this screenshot, and Jane Eyre is included there with some themes of some content from the book um, that, that might be triggering for individuals, and I'll, I'll talk about some of those in, in a little bit. But before we talk more about that in Jane Eyre and ethical, uh, the ethical debates surrounding trigger warnings, 
it is important to uh, understand how Jane Eyre as the novel came into existence. And it's important to understand more about Charlotte Bronte and her life. I think she is equally famous not only for the novels that she wrote, but also the family that she came from. So um, her sisters, of course, Anne and Emily were um, novelists in their in their own right. Um, Emily, of course, wrote Wuthering Heights, very, very famous work of fiction. Anne wrote Agnes Gray and the Tenant of Wild Bell Hall. So she lived in the village of Howard with her family. Her father, Pantor Fronte, was the curate. Um, and this here is a photo that I took of their house at the Bronte Parsonage Museum, which you can now visit. Uh, and it's, it's just really lovely. So the village of Howard is surrounded by the beautiful Yorkshire moors. And so the sisters would often take walks long walks every day on the moors to, to get out in nature and talk about art and life and, and writing and creativity. And so uh, Charlotte and her sisters were encouraged by their father to pursue their writing and creative pursuits throughout their lives. This here is a timeline of Charlotte Bronte's published works. In 1846, she published a, a small collection of poems with her sisters, Anne and Emily. They actually published these under um, androgynous pseudonyms, Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell, and that's actually what they published their, um, their novels under as well. Um, as you see, Jane Eyre was published in 1847. I'd like to point out The Professor was actually the first novel that Charlotte Bronte ever wrote, but it wasn't published until after her death in 1857. So the professor, Charlotte, sent it to, I think, at least nine different publishers, and it was rejected every time. Um, never one to let adversity get the best of her, however. This motivated Charlotte, and she was determined to write something that would get attention. And that was her masterpiece, Jane Eyre. So it's hard to talk about Jane Eyre without giving away some spoiler alerts. So I do apologize if you've never read the book. I'll try not to give away too many of the juicy details, but I'll just give you a little, little recap of what the book is about, because I think it's essential to talk about. We're going to talk about trigger warnings. So it is the story of a young orphan who endures many life struggles and obstacles, including emotional and physical abuse by her aunt who raises her and neglect and near starvation at the terrible Lowood school that she's sent to. Later, she becomes a governess at Thornfield Hall to Adele, the daughter of her employer, Mr. Rochester, with whom she falls in love with and nearly marries, but then discovers an impediment that he is still married and his mad wife is living on the third floor in a room uh, with, with her, her nurse caretaker. And that and all the, all the drama starts. So, and you can imagine when Jane Eyre was published, it was an instant bestseller. Most of the reviews and reactions to the book were overwhelmingly positive. As you see here, comments G.H. Lewis in Frazier's Magazine said this is indeed a book after our own heart. Uh, Thackeray himself read the book in one day. Uh, he was a huge fan of the novel, and that was something that uh, really flattered Charlotte as she was a huge admirer of Thackeray's works. However, as you see here, there were some negative reviews as well as some mixed reviews, largely from conservative reviewers. It was called an anti-Christian composition, an unfeminine, ungodly work. And really, Jane Eyre, there wasn't at that time a book that had ever been written like it. You have a, a plain, um, sensitive, shy narrator as, as the main character, kind of awkward, you know. Um, she wasn't the you know, sweepingly beautiful, typical um, heroine. She was strong, independent, had a will of her own, and nobody had seen anything like this. So it just really um, turned the, the literary world on upside down. 
also it's interesting to note um, is that uh, there there was this kind of a, addicting quality with the book and actually an American reviewer coined the phrase Jane Eyre fever because people would read it and they just couldn't put it down and actually out of this um, mothers and fathers uh, did not want their uh, or I should say not all mothers and fathers, but some did not want their young daughters to read the book for fear that it would um, influence them to become too independent and too strong willed um, like the narrator Jane. So so even back then there there was some um, you know some some positive but also um, uh, negative uh, or um, discourse around the book. So some of the themes and content in Jane Eyre, it is an incredibly powerful book with powerful content and unforgettable scenes and images. It takes a lot of its um, um, uh, themes from, from Gothic fiction. There's, there's a, a lot of um, Gothic literary themes. Um, it's beautifully written, nature is throughout the book, weather is really incorporated, a lot of symbolism. Um, it's a very atmospheric book. There's also a lot of content that is indeed very complex and, and difficult. Um, and I'll just kind of go through these chronologically um, as the book um, as the book goes on through the narrative. So in the beginning scenes within the first pages, Jane is um, living with her aunt Reed at Gateshead Hall with, with her three cousins and she is bullied terribly um, emotionally and physically. Then she is sent away to an awful school called Lowood where uh, the, the children are pretty much nearly starved to death, neglected, abused. Um, it's just it's just awful. Disease runs rampant through the school. Jane Eyre's um, best friend, Helen Burns, gets typhus and, and dies in Jane Eyre's arms. I mean, it is just um, heartbreaking. So there's death in the book, illness. Of course, the, the book was written in the Victorian era, um, you know, the, the height of the, the British Empire. There's imperialism, there's racism. You see some ethnic slurs in the book. Um, sexism, of course, a lot of patriarchy. Um, there is also ableism. People are um, discriminated against because of disabilities or mental illness, you see, especially focusing on the character of um, Bertha Mason, as you see here. This is Rochester's um, uh, mentally ill wife that is kept in, in the attic. Um, and her mental illness is sort of seen as is stigmatized. She's seen as sort of the other, she's often referred to as it. She's not really seen as human. Um, there is also a, a kind of a lesser explored aspect in the book, but some addiction. Um, and this is something that Charlotte Bronte would have had firsthand experience with, not herself, but her brother Branwell, who succumbed to alcoholism and opioid addiction. And at the time that um, Charlotte was writing, the book, Branwell was really in the throes of addiction. And in fact, he died in 1848, just a year later after the book was published. So Bertha Mason's nurse, Grace Poole, um, is um, always um, sneaking gin or, or, or drinks when she's taking care of Bertha. And, and also um, Jane Eyre's cousin, John Reed, later dies from uh, his addictive lifestyle later in the book. So you do have to wonder sometimes if, if some of this content, which a lot of it is autobiographical, including the scenes at the school, um, was sort of therapeutic for Charlotte Bronte to write um, because she was sent to a clergy daughter school that actually turned out um, to be very much like Lowood um, and, and her, her family pulled her out of the school um, actually after her, her two, two of her siblings did catch um, typhoid fever and pass away. So that whole scene with, with the school was also very um, autobiographical. So you wonder if some of the writing of this was therapeutic in and of itself. 
And there's also homelessness for a period when Charlotte, Charlotte or I should say Jane, leaves um, Thornfield. She uh, just doesn't have anywhere to go and she is homeless for, for a few days and begging and, and those scenes are very um, emotional. And of course there, there's violence and, and also a scene of suicide in the book. So these are the, the themes that um, have um, that have made some put this on a, a trigger warning list. So a little bit more information about the uh, trigger warning debate, the ethical debate. <clears throat> there is both opposition and support for both uh, for, from both sides here. Those opposed to trigger warnings see it as a form of indirect censorship and a threat to free speech and academic freedom. Non-traumatic discomfort is necessary for learning, right? They also see trigger warnings as ineffective and actually harmful, maybe by, you know, posing trigger warnings that in and of itself can, can be triggering. And also this is, I think, one of the most um, common themes that you see with, with the debate is that if trigger warnings are issued for, for classic literature or other literary works, learners could run the risk of avoiding that intellectually challenging material that actually have the, the power to really change your life and enrich their personal growth and enhance their, their learning experience. And also, trigger warnings could put learners in a bubble and it narrows their worldview. And I think this is a common theme that you see as well. The problem with trigger warnings a lot of times is they may focus on just one very small aspect of a book rather than seeing the, the whole picture. And I think one of the speakers, I think it was Ben in the, at the opening um, talk, mentioned that, how the, his favorite book when he was younger was banned just because of that one, one little, little section in the book. Those in favor of trigger warnings see them as an act of empathy and responsible pedagogy that could minimize harm and an appropriate accommodation for learners with mental illness, including PTSD. And they do not see them as a form of indirect censorship, but rather something that could lead to open discussion and authentic discourse that creates transparency and gives learners a choice. So you see the, the debate is very highly nuanced. In many ways, you could see it from both sides. So it, it, it is, it's, it's not very um, cut and dry, it's, it's highly nuanced. So various organizations have issued statements relating to trigger warnings, including the AAUP, American Association of University Professors. They've been very vocal in taking a firm stance of opposition toward them, and you can read their statement there. The American Library Association, the ALA, um, while having not issued an official statement on trigger warnings per se, they, they do have in the Library Bill of Rights, we have um, the statement on labeling systems. Um, and those who um, uh, oppose trigger warnings often cite the ALA's um, labeling system statement here um, because trigger warnings could be seen or interpreted as kind of a, a system of, of prejudicial labeling of reading materials that can have detrimental effects and go against the whole um, Library Bill of Rights of free access to information and, and ideas. So trigger warnings have been called a genuine ethical dilemma. There is a wonderful book that I recommend um, that was published in 2017, it's edited by uh, Emily Knox, who is a professor uh, and librarian in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois. So it's just an excellent collection of essays and case studies that really address all of the nuances surrounding both sides of the trigger content warning debate. So what if we move beyond trigger warnings and found a solution somewhere in the middle rooted in what has been called an ethic of care. 
according to the authors of this article, which again is also a wonderful read, Rebecca Flintoff and Christopher Bollinger in their article here called Beyond Trigger Warnings, they argue that this is certainly possible by rethinking our pedagogical practices. So they include some very practical strategies for incorporating difficult or disturbing reading material into the classroom without the need to issue trigger warnings. So one a technique that they suggest is scaffolding learning activities. Um, and this is actually something when I was reading this, I thought, wow, we do that in the library in information literacy instruction, we kind of scaffold what we teach so that you know we start kind of small and then get bigger as we go to build student skills. So it's kind of the same thing here, except you gradually increase the level of intensity with each assignment or discussion about specific um, trauma-related reading material. And so this allows educators to identify difficulty as it emerges, not after it has peaked with the students. So I thought that was just a very, very practical um, take home there. As I was putting this presentation, I started to think about bibliotherapy. Um, and bibliotherapy is kind of, I think, within that ethic of care, or maybe ethic of maybe even an ethic of self-care. Um, with bibliotherapy, it is a psychological therapeutic approach to facilitate patient recovery from mental illness or trauma. It involves personal identification with a character or characters in a book resulting in psychological catharsis that leads to clarity, insight, and solutions. Instead of thinking of content as triggering, what if we thought of it as a catalyst for healing? And this book by Vanessa Zoltan was published in 2021, and uh, it's called Praying with Jane Eyre. And she reflects on her personal relationship with the novel and how the ritual of rereading it has helped her cope with her own personal struggles and life challenges, including depression, and anger, fear, and anxiety. So I thought that was kind of another way to sort of reframe this and think about triggering content. What if we viewed it instead as a catalyst for healing and change and understanding? And so I'll, I'll close with a personal anecdote. Um, I read Jane Eyre when I was 17. I, I'll never forget the day. It was a Friday afternoon, got out of school, was having a bad day. And I had this reading list of, of, I think it was like something like classic novels every teenage girl should read that I got out of Seventeen Magazine. I took it with me to the library and I literally went through the list and I got every book that I could that was available. And the only book that was available was Jane Eyre. I had never heard of Charlotte Bronte. I had never heard of Jane Eyre. I didn't even know how to pronounce Eyre. I was like, how do you, how do you say that? Let's say Eyre or Eyre. And um, I started reading it that evening and took it home and I finished it the next day. And as soon as I was done reading it, I opened it up again and read it all over from the beginning. I was hooked. And it really opened up a world of classic literature for me. And then I read everything else by Charlotte Bronte, everything else by, by the other, by the Bronte sisters. Um, and when I read Jane, I remember going to the back and looking at the other classics that were listed. I think it was a Penguin Classics edition. And then I started to read George Eliot and uh, uh, Jane Austen and all, all the other great classic uh, writers. Spent a lot of time at Thackeray and the public library. And then my mom said to me, Joe, you live at the library. Why don't you get a job there? So I started to work there as a shelver. And I said, gosh, I love this. I want to make this a career. And so here I am. So I owe everything to Jane Eyre. <laughs> I always say that. Um, very much. It's, it's a very, very special book to me. And so I thought I would close with this quote, which I think just encapsulates the essence of freedom. This is a very famous quote from Jane Eyre. Um, and freedom is what we are talking about today. So there we go. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful.